2021 uh, city council meeting. Uh, we will start this evening with m m that I will call this meeting to order and Claudia will do a roll call. Councilor Garvin. Here. Councilor Geary. Good evening. Councilor Minky. Here. Councilor Chenoa. Present. Councilor Peralta. Here. Council President Drevkin. Here. And Mayor Hill. Here. Um, Sal, could you lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance this evening? I would be glad to, Mayor. Thank you. Thank you. I pledge allegiance to the flag, flag. of the United the States of America, of America and to the Republic, the Republic for which it stands, stands. One, one nation, nation under God, under God. indivisible, with liberty, liberty and justice and for all. For all. Thank you, Sal, for leading us in that. Uh, next on our agenda this evening is comments from citizens. And this is the opportunity for members on the Zoom or in the audience to uh, provide comments to the city, uh, to, uh, the city council. Um, and I will also let you know that these would be comments that are received by city council. Any follow-up, we will assign uh, comments to go back to those individuals by a member of the city staff. Now, anyone can speak on topics other than a matter that's in litigation, a quasi-judicial land use matter, or a matter scheduled for a uh, public hearing at some future date. Uh, each will be given a three minute limit to speak to the council. Uh, if, you, um, if you're working through Claudia uh, and have filled out a sheet, then that's all that's necessary. Just identify yourself. For those that haven't filled out the sheet, then we would need to um, have your name and address for the public record. And so Claudia, do we have anyone that signed up for public comment this evening? No, Mayor. Okay, then let's move on. We have a presentation this evening of um, from Visit McMinnville, and this is their annual report with a presentation to us from their board of directors. So Jeff Knapp and I know Kitri and, and members of their board are on the line. So Jeff, we'll turn it over to you. Good evening. Okay, there I am. Hi, everyone. Nice to see you. Uh, Jeff Knapp, Visit McMinnville Executive Director. It is good to be back here for, is this my sixth presentation? Fifth or sixth presentation. So um, I should know the exact one, but annually we get to come before you, uh, tell you what has happened over the last year, talk about what we're working on currently, and then um, uh, propose our plan for next year. So per our contract with you as our city uh, partners, um, at the end of this presentation, there'll be an opportunity for questions and for you to vote on our annual um, plan. So uh, without any more ado, I'll kick this off. I wanted to first acknowledge uh, my team and board here that are, uh, I know that are on the call, there may be more here, but what I'm, uh, uh, sure, who I'm certain here are here are Kitri McGuire, who is our Director of Marketing and Communications, um, Jamie Korf, who we're very excited to have joined the team uh, this past year as our Marketing and Communications Coordinator and has been integral in uh, the success of our, our programming this last year. And of course, we are a board-governed organization, and our board president, Aaron Stevenson, is here uh, representing uh, the, the board and uh, community stakeholders. So uh, without more of that, we'll jump into the presentation. I'm going to share my screen here, and we will get moving along, hopefully. Excellent. Um, is everyone able to see that first slide that says fiscal year 2022? Yeah, Jeff, it's on. Okay, excellent. So just a reminder, um, Visit McMinnville is a 501c6 contract with the city of McMinnville to perform economic development services. So our main goal is to get as many people as possible to know about McMinnville, to choose to come stay in our community and spend as many dollars as possible with local businesses. Um, we are a board governed organization and we have a staff of three. 
over the last year, some of our austerity measures, we did have to let a one uh, employee, a contract employee go who was in charge of events. Uh, but we did manage to retain our other two employees at full time during the last year. And we've done a lot of amazing work with their help. Um, reminder why we exist, economic development. We are focused outward while our other stable table partners locally are focused inward. Um, that would be the Economic Development Partnership, MEDP, the Downtown Association, the Chamber, and of course, the, the tabletop itself, the city. So why are we here? Why is the visitor economy important? Um, if we don't know the answer to that question after the last year's pandemic and global impact, the, um, I don't know what else would uh, punctuate the importance of the visitor economy. So frontline hospitality and service jobs over the last year were decimated, as we all know. Um, there's not really words to quantify, quantify how difficult the service industry has had it over the last year. Um, so I'd like to shout out to all of the community leaders who have worked tirelessly to figure out how to support all aspects of our community, and even more so to those local stakeholders out there, restaurants, lodging, retail, that have really ridden a nightmare roller coaster ride. Uh, some not making it out on the other side with uh, businesses and health intact, uh, but most and many having weathered the storm and, and we are now seeing coming out on the other side. So these numbers that we're gonna look at first about the, the visitor economy in the state, um, they're all based on 2019 numbers. We don't have the firm numbers looking um, immediately backward yet, but at the height of you know 2019, the economy was the largest as ever was in Oregon. So $12.8 billion industry in Oregon, almost 120,000 direct jobs, $592 million in state and local tax revenue. In Yamhill County alone, 100, nearly $140 million in direct visitor spending, um, approaching 2,000 direct jobs. Those jobs aren't including all of the ancillary things, the wine industry that, you know, branch out from there, but direct um, lodging, food service, recreation, entertainment, and transportation jobs. And the good news is that compared to all other parts of the region, McMinnville is significantly outpacing growth in visitor spending over the last five years. So over the last five years that we've had as an organization, uh, as, you know, had we've been in operation for just over five years, McMinnville has seen a 79.3% growth in visitor spending as compared to uh, what averages about a 16% if we look at the state and the region. So what does that mean for McMinnville? Um, ultimately, the visitor economy here creates revenue, it creates jobs, it also improves quality of life, and it makes us an attractive spot for uh, people to perhaps relocate their business or move their families. And uh, those types of visitor services also provide, um, you know, places that people love to, to frequent and enjoy. Um, so, in McMinnville, in 2019, we had close to $40 million of direct visitor spending, 430 direct jobs, and that segment of leisure and hospitality alone um, accounted for about 8% of all of our city's employment. So um, getting into last year as an organization, our organization works with a two-level two-prong approach. We activate data-driven, high-quality marketing and PR to sort of prime the pump and tell people about our destination, get them here and to spend as, many, as much money, I keep saying that, but that's our goal. Uh, and that's our main focus. And second, we focus on destination development opportunities, which are projects that contribute both to uh, the experience for visitors, but also the quality of life for citizens. So with that lens, uh, I'd like to turn it over to um, Kitri McGuire, our Director of Marketing, to tell you a little bit, of look in the rear view, uh, what we've done uh, over the past year in terms of um, communications and PR. Ooh. Well, hello, everybody. I'm Kitra McGuire. I um, am very proud to work at Visit McMinnville for the past five years. Um, I've lived in McMinnville for about five years now, but I was also a uh, Linfield alum. So this is my second stint here in McMinnville, and I'm absolutely loving it. My family um, couldn't be happier here. Two kids at Memorial, it's just such a wonderful place, and it's a joy to be able to uh, share my love of McMinnville with potential visitors every day. 
Um, so during the past year on the marketing side of things at Visit McMinnville, the two most important things on our minds when it came to marketing were first to keep locals and visitors safe. And then second, to support our friends and neighbors who work in and own local businesses. And for Visit McMinnville, marketing includes two major buckets paid opportunities like um, placing an ad in a magazine or purchasing a radio spot and what are known as unpaid opportunities like um, pitching the media on a story idea or creating a mutually beneficial brand partnership. And then in the past year, I mean, as we all know, marketing has been a huge challenge due to changing rules from the governor's office on where we could and couldn't share our messaging constantly updated best practices from the tourism agencies that we often get insights from like Travel Oregon and US Travel. And of course, all of the forced closures and restrictions that were turned on and off again. And over the second half of 2020 and into 2021, Visit McMinnville really, really worked hard to stay on top of all the recommendations and make nimble, targeted marketing decisions so that we could pull back and re-aim our efforts on a moment's notice if we needed to. Uh, we kept visitors informed of current health advisories, um, restrictions to keep our community safe, and ensure guests knew what to expect when they arrived here. And we always made sure that our messaging and creative were in alignment with the tone of the times, even if that sometimes meant changing those things several times in a week. Um, a few things that stand out to me that I'm particularly proud of during this time that I wanted to take this opportunity to share with all of you. Um, first, we really modified our social media strategy to more heavily amplify individual businesses uh, through creative storytelling and the use of time-based social media features like Instagram and Facebook stories. By doing this, we were able to encourage immediate calls to action for potential visitors, like attending a socially distant event like Winter on 3rd or the BIPOC block party, or to push forward a special deal that uh, people who are dreaming of McMinnville could purchase online or a special announcement from an individual business. And I have to really shout out Jamie Korf here who leads our social media efforts. She really knocked it out of the park this year with engagement and keeping things really interesting. Second, we kept in constant touch with the media. We made sure that we had relevant pitches for them to write about um, on all the unique, cool, and new ways that our businesses were serving community, our community and guests uh, so that we could keep the name McMinnville in front of a national audience. Uh, one of the ways we did that is we hosted a virtual familiarization event for over a dozen national writers. Uh, we featured four local business owners. We sent all of the writers a special gift box with McMinnville made food and wine and beer that they could enjoy during the event. And within the past month, we've had several of those writers tell us that they're vaccinated now and want to come out and experience McMinnville um, for pieces that they're writing in places like the New York Times, Food and Wine Magazine, and several others. So um, it's paying off and we couldn't be more excited. Um, the third thing I wanted to share with you is that we created a new, very, very popular video series that we call McMinnville Inspires. And in these 30 second videos, we're able to tell little snippets of McMinnville's many complex and lovely stories, but no voiceover, just imagery of the people and places that make McMinnville a special place to experience. Things like um, cycling, foraging, creating art, mixology, dining outside. Um, I mean, all that sounds like a, pl like a place I'd wanna check out. Um, these videos were among some of our most engaged social media posts ever, and we've shared them all over via digital ad placements to encourage other people to come and visit. And I'd encourage you to check out the videos. If you go to YouTube and search McMinnville Inspires, a custom playlist will pop up and you can see um, some of these videos. Um, Lastly, with a limited ability to encourage travel from outside of our immediate area, we really pivoted hard to supporting projects in town. And these projects, which we call destination development, which is that second prong that Jeff was talking about, 
um, make McMinnville a more desirable destination to visitors, but also have the side benefit of making it a more lovely place for locals too. Uh, Jeff, do you want to take it from here? Sure, I will take it over. Um, are we sharing screen again? Does everyone see yeah. that? Okay, awesome. So thank you, Kitri. A um, little bit about some of the tangible destination development op things that we focused on over the past year and uh, getting into, again, things that we could do on the ground to uh, help both visitors and improve quality of life. So uh, we focused on some wayfinding and social distancing sidewalk art. So you probably have seen or remember some of that sidewalk art encouraging six foot distancing over the past year when uh, all of the mandates came out. We uh, partnered with the MDA to uh, not only add some art and some safety messaging, but also we put in some tactical urbanization or, or, or tactical wayfinding, which uh, led people to certain spots around town um, as sort of a precursor for a larger, hopefully future wayfinding uh, investment and partnership with the city. We partnered with the city to help fund kiosks and lighting. So lighting up our all of the local benches, kiosks, and providing some illuminated kiosks for mapping and information for visitors, really focused on getting uh, visitors on foot from the library and city park all the way down third street and through the city's investment in the granary and alpine district so um, those are always our our our, our goals as far as uh, getting people to to experience mcminnville uh, via foot and bike um, very proud to announce that due to a very effective partnership with the downtown association kitri mcguire wrote a successful $48,000 grant supporting the upcoming Dine Outside program, which is going to um, add a lot of uh, a lot of pizzazz to uh, not only the Dine Outside program, but some long-term infrastructure things for the downtown. Those are including uh, some safety lighting uh, down corridors uh, from the public parking uh, that is off of third to dine outside, uh, some new marketing materials, a couple of stages um, for live music performances downtown, a new uh, vehicle, a little uh, cart that can help set up events like when we have our parades and our concerts that can help uh, move stuff around and provide some uh, non-manpower. I know Councillor Geary's back will thank, thank that cart, I'm sure, um, as well as some twinkle lights and things like that. So uh, a lot, we as an organization committed uh, $6,000 to marketing uh, efforts and in turn, um, Travel Oregon issued um, this lovely grant. On top of that, uh, we are being acknowledged uh, on a state level as a leader in this area and uh, at the governor's tourism conference next week, uh, Kitri will be speaking on behalf of McMinnville uh, with this as a model, what an effective partnership looks like with a downtown association uh, and the city uh, and what it looks like to execute down out, execute a program like Dine Outside where you get community buy-in, you have OLCC involved, you have the city with permitting, you've got, you know, there's a lot of pieces of that puzzle and honestly a lot of places haven't been able to crack that nut. Uh, and we have done uh, kudos to all of everyone that has been helpful in this area. Um, they they want to know how we've done it. So we'll be representing McMinnville. Kitri will be next week about that. And then last but not least in your view, the rear view mirror, one of the things that we're really excited about is bringing more public art to town. So we are working with the public art committee uh, on um, implementing some murals. So in the last year we hung a mural uh, in the Granary District um, uh, that we had produced on one of our activations when we took McMinnville to New York City. This year, we are currently under a request for artists for a piece that will be going in along Third Street and the train tracks there uh, by the Yamhill County Housing Authority. There's a long cinder block wall. So we are working in partnership with the Public Art Committee and we will be um, uh, erecting a community mural there uh, come the end of summer. And that will be provide arts and culture, but also provide some wayfinding to encourage people to feel like they want to continue exploring when you get to those train tracks and feel safe continuing moving to explore the greenery. So what we're currently working on wrapping up this year is targeted marketing and PR. We're turning on the nozzle uh, for marketing uh, 
initially targeting uh, the state of Oregon. We will be moving to also targeting the Seattle metro area with all forms of advertising that are appropriate. Uh, I mean, as far as uh, messaging goes post COVID. Uh, two, we are, uh, we hear the industry loud and clear. One of the things that is the most difficult for reopening is staffing. Everyone on all levels is having an issue finding staff uh, to uh, fill what are quite a few open positions in our uh, hospitality and service industry. So we're working with community partners on both short-term and long-term workforce support and planning. Uh, the hospitality and service industry in Yamo County is, is a really con critical component and it's intricately woven to a $7 billion agriculture and manufacturing uh, industry with the wine industry. So um, we have a uniquely intricately woven service industry with that that is unfortunately historically not represented on a from a workforce development standpoint we've got i don't know if you know this but there's nine oregon workforce boards um, that focus on um, representing workforce and up until last week none of them focused on hospitality as a as a sector of importance so we finally have one um, which is the Northwest Oregon Works that is saying, you know, uh, hospitality is an important sector of our economy. So there's still a lot of opportunity uh, to crack that nut for us. And we're going to be working on data and things to support that messaging uh, throughout the state. Um, so we are also continuing the mural program will be another site that we announce hopefully in this upcoming year. Uh, once this uh, next one is done, we are installing uh, two bicycle repair stations and working with a high school on some potential other bicycle uh, rack and cover infrastructure. So we're working with uh, all partners on, on that. You'll see one uh, new bicycle repair station going up at the library and one going up in the granary district, district to support uh, cycling uh, in the area. Uh, also for locals who might want to replace, you know, also use that public air station and fix fix up their bike and this is going to be a really big year for data investment as an organization this data is going to be a game changer for how effective and targeted we can be with our efforts but this data will also be extremely beneficial to our partners with the city and the other economic development partners around the table as we'll be able to really target um uh a really rich set of data uh, based on cell phones and consumer spending, uh, which I think will be really helpful in recruiting businesses and supporting the ones that we have. Um, we're going to take that data and we're going to go out and uh, go on sort of a visitor economy impact tour. So we'll be back to give you some, we'll be back to, to bore you with some more slides on, on all of the data we've got. Um, so now is the part where this is really the core of our fiscal 22 plan. Um, this is, as a council, what you're going to be voting in support of tonight. Um, you know, COVID enforced the idea that plans need to be really flexible and adaptable, and we as an organization have been extremely such, and to uh, the city's benefit, I'll tell you a little bit about that as we get into this. but. We intend to use these goals as the guide for all of our efforts for the next year. So I will read through these for you. Um, so our main goal is to attract visitors safely and quickly to spend money with local businesses. Uh, two, we're going to be highlighting McMinnville as a top destination of choice for post COVID travel, predominantly focused again to Oregon and Seattle Metro. Um, that being said, we will be reaching out with PR to the world. So our message will get out there further through uh, earned media, but our dollars will be spent targeting um, the closer drive markets. Um, we're going to be supporting local businesses and seeking out new business investments. So we're going to be working with our partners with MEDP and with um, the data that we have to recruit uh, new visitor service stakeholder type businesses. Um, one of our biggest things with our destination development is to diversify our destination beyond food and craft beverage. We are extremely happy that we have wine and beer and food. However, we don't want to be a one hit wonder. So we are focused on um, outdoor recreation expansion, particularly in the areas of cycling. Of course, we'd always be open to river access and other things, but cycling is our main um, point of, uh, we've got a lot of headway there and it's going to, we're making a lot of process there 
progress. And then in arts and culture, so supporting arts and culture, and then trying to crack this agritourism nut. That's a bigger picture, long-term goal, but I think there's a lot to come there, especially with the potential partnership of Evergreen and Steve Scott and their potential uh, foray into the world of ag uh, innovation. So amplifying connectivity of core tourism attractions and districts, that's again telling people how to get where effectively when they're here on the ground. And then leveraging the visitor economy to support the larger Mac Town economic development plan. We meet and lead the discussions with the EVLC regularly or help lead that. Uh, and we are really happy to be a part of that. Um, and then again, continue to develop content inclusive of diverse communities. We, I feel like we've always done that. We heard you loud and clear last year and we uh, continue to work on uh, that content and how we operate uh, within the realm of uh, diversity, equity and inclusion within our organization. What does that mean for numbers? Um, we have great news about performance as an organization over the last year and as a destination. Uh, great news in the sense that it was a really bad year. Uh, however, relative to a lot of destinations, we did not have it as bad as many. We saw fewer businesses closed than many. Uh, and we actually, uh, it looks, if you look at our FY21 there on the right, I don't know if I can really point to things with this, but $593,000, which is, has us down 32% of revenue, um, which I, on a state level, I think the average is probably closer to a 50% uh, reduction in revenue. So I think our strengths of being a rural leisure focused destination helped us over the last year. And I think it will be our greatest strength as we move out of COVID. So we are currently predicting uh, FY22 budget of $816,000, which will be nearly flat to where we were in fiscal year 20. Um, and I think that's a conservative prediction. Uh, we may be able to all things uh, said and done, be able to exceed that, um, but it's looking positive. Um, what that means for the city is roughly $366,000 of revenue through the TLT, if these numbers are correct. And this is how we propose our budget to be broken down. So uh, the majority of our efforts, again, dollars being put into marketing and PR and communications, uh, roughly 20% of our budget to development off opportunities and projects that impact um, our partners downtown and further uh, diversify outdoor recreation and arts and culture and agritourism. Um, and then 11% uh, to our basic operations expenses, um, you know, keeping the lights on, things clean and um, books kept. Um, and I am proud to say that we will have, uh, as we enter into the fiscal next fiscal year, uh, per our contract with the city, uh, fully funded reserves of $120,000. So historically in the past, uh, those reserves have been uh, at 75,000 and in this new contract, we are able to uh, be fully funded as we move into our next um, fiscal year. So in conclusion, we're extremely, uh, we are entering into a period of an economic rebound that we're really excited about. Uh, we're very well positioned to help make significant positive impact in McMinnville while at the same time, you know, working to develop the destination in ways that also improve our quality of life. And we're gonna do that with our talented staff. Uh, we've got a really great staff. You guys, you don't even know. Um, we are the envy of the state with our staff and fostering effective partnerships. So we are extremely excited about where we're at given the, the grim nature of the last year and would love to open it up for questions. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Jeff and Kitri for the presentation and members of the board that are with us this evening. Um, let's open it up uh, for staff to, um, why don't you go ahead and um, shrink your screen, uh, Jeff, so that we can get everyone there and see. Uh, uh, let me see how I can do that one second, sorry. No problem. Da, da, da. Am I still sharing? You are, yeah. <laughs> Now, now your your screen's up. Okay, there we go. So, counselors, any any questions you would have of uh, Jeff and Visit McMindell? Uh, 
I just wanted to say, Jeff, I really appreciated the presentation tonight. Um, I know this last year has been tough for you and the entire industry that you represent. And I just wish you every success this year going forward. And thank you for such a thoughtful plan. Thank you, Councilor Peralta. Appreciate it. Any other questions? I'll tell you, I know that uh, um, Jeff Towery and uh, Kelly Menke, who sit on the Visit McMinnville board, and myself, I try to go to all of their board meetings, how um, you know they talk about being nimble to be able to move uh, given the last uh, year and a half uh, and the funding mechanism. But I'll tell you, they've not lost focus one bit in, in uh, being prepared for what's coming up uh, this summer. So, uh, I really appreciate that. Uh, Zach? Thanks, Mr. Mayor. Uh, thank you, Jeff and your staff for putting that together and running through that cool presentation. I had a couple of just comments and then one question. Um, first, sort of thanks for um, helping me, of course, because everything's about me in the whole entire universe. Um, thanks for helping me just grow and appreciate appreciate the and add to the growing list of ways that make me really proud to be from here not only originally but to currently do what i do and represent the town um it just the ways keep growing and it's always really fun to see and and you guys are a big um color on that canvas uh and it's really cool to tell people um and lord it over people that i'm from here and i get to live work and play here um also, I think, um, I know you guys have been working on destination development, but I feel like, you know, two, three years ago, two years ago, there was a, a, a big discussion around sort of wanting to see more um, things that were in that destination development bucket um, happening. And I think you heard that, focused on it and did it. And I want to say thanks. And um the what you guys produce isn't for me to judge other than just it looks really good and and um i i like seeing it knowing that you're out there and i know that that translates into more ways than i am aware because i don't understand how computers work but um so i i think that what you get the work you guys have done on specifically on destination development is super cool um and i really appreciate that uh those are my two um statements and then my question is a little bit more esoteric and sort of could be for anyone in your you know, you probably would like to hear your answer, but then anyone re representing your organization today is coming out of the pandemic. What did it teach you about your organization and your mission, and and what did what did you what did you learn from it, and and you know how is it going to make you better at running and doing what you're doing? Um, that's a great question. Thank you. Um, I learned that how we have been operating and the plan that was put forth from our board in the city uh, is not only is not only does it work, it's set to uh, be resilient. So, um, and what I mean by that is um, we are nimble, you know, we, our goal, we, we don't commit to large projects with our dollars. Um, the dollars that we have, if they are large, we, they're very well planned for. Um, and there are many organizations that honestly on the other side that are DMOs that are sitting in this position that are not going to come out of this in a way that is effective. Um, and it's going to be a long time for them to build back up. So kudos to those that came before me that were integral in setting the framework by kind of which we operate, uh, give a lot of kudos to Aaron Stevenson and to Scott and Kelly who were there from the beginning of you know, really setting that up. Um, and the the other thing I learned it, from this is that you know you can have a res well there's two more things there, there's a lot more than two. Another thing you can have this reserve fund which we have for emergency situations and still not be able to use it you know because during COVID uh, you know when we're the most effective when we're marketing and getting people to come and when we can't do that it doesn't matter how much money we have. So what we can do while we're unable to market is focus on projects that are development projects. And so we were able to, you know, funnel momentum that we had that direction and continue and execute uh, projects that make sense. And we will continue to do that. So um, 
I think our priority will always be marketing first, which is, our, you know, what the statute says. And, but there's also this part of, you know, it's, we, there's a lot that we can do to build out touch points for visitors here on the ground and within uh, the community. Did that answer your, your question? Did you, did you uh, learn anything, Aaron? That was, the, that was the correct answer. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, that did. That was super insightful. That's also going to be a comforting, comforting sensation, right? You build a, you you crash land on the beach and you build a, a little shelter to keep you dry, and then the storm hits and you actually stay dry, right? You. Know, that was I would say not nice. only did we stay dry, but we we're coming out on the other end of this extremely strong. Right. So we are able to fire. We can flip the lights on the second the governor says we're open, or even now we can deploy significant targeted resources that will be and will be in market more, louder than many other places so that was so cool um it's really cool it's really exciting aaron did you have something to add no not specifically other than to to re reiterate how much we appreciate our continued partnership with um with the city and it, it has undoubtedly been the most difficult year any of us could have ever imagined or remember for the hospitality industry but over and over again, I've been so impressed by the heart um, of the business people in this community, our government officials, um, and everybody living here. Uh, Dine Outside was a great example of how McMinnvillians dig deep, get creative, and show up to support one another. And it just, they're, they're things I've known about this community my whole life and, you know, was not at all surprised by, but just heartened. That, that spirit that I feel like really defines us as a community is alive and well, and it and it will see us through any storm. So, you know, on, on behalf of the board and, um, you know, the rest of the hospitality industry, we just, we so appreciate the continued partnership from everyone who has supported with their dollars um, and and their hearts really in keeping our businesses going this, this past year. So a, a million thanks to you all. Thanks, Erin. Go ahead, Kelly. Sorry to be a little bit slow on this, but I, I do want to reiterate that you, <laughs> Mr. McMinnville has an incredible staff. I mean, Kitri out there joining boards and bringing in $84,000 in grants is pretty amazing. And Jeff just does all sorts of stuff. It's just incredible. He's sort of the negotiator of the entire region, I believe. And he's on many boards. So, it, and Thank you so much, Jamie, for all the work you've done on social media this year. It's a remarkable group of people and they've done an extremely good job. It was pretty tough sitting in some of those earlier <laughs> meetings when everything was going in a handbasket. Hand I mean, everybody was firing people or laying people off and it's, it's happened several times now and they've all stayed fairly optimistic and hung in there and uh, it's a remarkable board. Yeah, I don't think you could find better people. So. From my perspective, it's been really a pleasure to work with everyone and be a part of it. Thank you, Councillor. We take what we do, uh, A, we have the best jobs in the world to get to represent where we live and make this impact on a place that we love and the people that we love. Um, so we take it very seriously and uh, it's, it's been a long year when you're in charge of uh, helping people that were suffering that type of horrible you know, impact on their businesses. but. Uh, we are on, we're getting to be on the other side of it and it looks very, very positive for us. So thank you, Jeff, let's put Corey Park on the list next year. Hey, that is, <laughs> I, yeah, you've, heard, you've heard work. Yeah. So <laughs> that is something we're considering is doing, there's some well, feasibility this, studies that we're looking into for some, just leave it as a teaser. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Aaron, you Yes, the, more to come. We want to be partner. We, yes. Well, again, uh, Jeff, thank you uh, for the report this evening. You presented to us uh, your plan and a high level budget for 2022. And so with that being said, 
um, a part of your packet, a part of the slides and then the packet that you received was the business plan for Visit McMinnville 2022 and a high level budget because there are things such in flux, but as we see an, uh, an estimated revenue for their fiscal year of 816,104 and at the um, balanced budget of estimated expenses coming out to that same number. So I will take a motion uh, from the floor uh, to accept the Visit McMinnville budget and uh, business plan for 2022. I'm, I'm happy to make that motion, but I think maybe after, uh, I think Cowery's had his digital hand up. Okay. Uh, <laughs> I can't even see. Oh, there's Jeff right up at the t right next to me. I don't look that close, Jeff. You're on mute. Thank you, Mayor, members of the council. I'd like to add my thanks uh, to Visit McMinnville and the board, specifically for the partnership uh, between Visit McMinnville and the city on our rebranding project this year. And uh, I know we've talked about this with you before. Um, the, the full Visit McMinnville board got to see the results of that project at their last meeting. And I wanna say one more time how much we appreciated specifically the work of Kitri McGuire. She was with our team every step of the way and the consultants from Factory North um, every time I talked to Kylie about how the project was going, she had good things to say about Kitri and talked about how much um, our team learned from Kitri and working through the process. So um, great result by all. And also just a shout out to Jamie's new glamour pick. That's awesome. Absolutely. Thank you, Jeff, for those, uh, those insights. So again, I am asking for a motion to accept the business plan and uh, budget for 2022. So moved, Mr. Mayor. Okay, and the okay uh, it's been moved by Zach and seconded by uh, Kelly. All in favor, please indicate by saying aye. 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 Any opposed, please indicate. The business plan and financials for Visit McMinnville 2022 has uh, passed unanimously uh, this evening with City Council. Again, thank you, uh, Jeff and team. Thank you, everyone. And um, I look forward to hopefully meeting uh, in person sometime in the near future and seeing all of you. Uh, I miss that. So Absolutely. thanks for all the work that you do. Uh, I, I, and all the work you've done on the budget. This has been a really tough year. I sat in and watched some of that and you guys have been in a lot of meetings. So <laughs> thanks for your time and all that you do. Thank you, Jeff. Okay, um, that now moves us over to advice and information items this evening. Opportunity for the counselors to report on their committees and board assignments. And so again, I'm just going to, uh, I'll start with Adam first. all uh we haven't had an airport commission meeting since our last meeting and uh, most of our wycom meeting was around budget and the 25 percent reduction in police dues that we went over during the budget process here um last night so that's all i have to report and uh i should have something at our next council meeting thank you adam uh let's go to sal Sorry, Mr. Mayor, my, my mute button was stuck. Um, can you hear me okay? I can, yes. Thank you, sorry about that. Uh, so we had uh, a rental inspection program meeting today, uh, good vigorous conversation about the potential terms of the program. And I think we made pretty good progress in terms of uh, getting agreements on, on different portions, including uh, uh, some additional pieces that the the landlords were requesting but i'm i'm very hopeful that we'll uh, have a good product to present to the council by the end of the year uh, and did not have any council of government meetings uh, yet our legislative committee meets tomorrow and the budget committee will meet on uh, june 1st to go through the cogs uh, 2021 budget thank you sal 
Uh, let's move to Chris. Chris. Uh, the McMinnville, thank you, Mr. Mayor. The McMinnville um, uh, Economic Vitality Leadership Council met on the 12th. Um, talk, talking points were, um, you know, working toward trying to gather information towards goal number one, um, which was to accelerate growth and living wage jobs across a balanced array of industry sectors. And what we're trying to do there is um, identify and market amenities to professional skilled workers that will attract workforce that have been leaving our community and not, and, and we haven't seen that same age group coming into our community. Um, we did find that, or uh, found out that uh, Joya at the Chamber has been offered an opportunity from an international uh, fellow um, that um, will be, that is multilingual um, and is a data expert who will be potentially helping us to develop and distribute a questionnaire toward that end, um, which was exciting. We have free, a very well-skilled person to help us do that. Um, we also um, uh, uh, discussed again, um, what we're gonna be doing, trying to raise funds to help with the downtown improvement program. And that was about it. The My other meeting will be on Thursday of this week, so I have nothing else to report. Thank you, Chris. Uh, let's go to Kelly. Good evening. Uh, since you've had a very good report from Visit McMinnville, I'm gonna talk about YCAP tonight. I just got out of a meeting a few minutes before I came into the level 10, so. Um, several things. One of the new things that YCAP is doing is a client survey. This is put out by the CSBG in the actual, in their original standards. And actually YCAP should have been doing this all along. Um, but, uh, obviously they've been held up by a number of different things. Uh, so what's happened is they created this kind of half page, uh, questionnaire, which they're asking anyone who receives services from YCAP to fill out. Uh, some of the questions are, uh, I got information or services I needed, was informed about the other YCAP or community services, would recommend YCAP or to family and friends. I'm willing to share my story. I felt welcome. The building and staff are following safety protocols. And then there's an opportunity for uh, them to make comments of their own on this particular thing. And this will go on, we'll get a updated report, I think in September, but uh, the main report will go in at the end of the year. Um, so this is one of the projects that they're picking up that have been dropped for a while and, and making happen. Uh, going over to the housing uh, particular issues, uh, the motelling project, they now have 66 households in the project. Uh, they can sustain this through June 30th. Uh, they've had great success with permanent housing support. 75% have done this transition into more permanent housing. And they're looking to FEMA with the assistance from McMinnville for support through September 2021. I believe that McMinnville is assisting them with that. Uh, on their project turnkey, it is still in process, but it is actually nearing finalization. Uh, the Providence System and YCAP are partners and, and then another association with the Providence System. They uh, were $5.5 million short <clears throat> in what they needed for this particular project. And they had gotten in 3.8 million and they needed an additional 1.7 million. Uh, Alexandria called OHCA today and had a chat with them and they said, yep, we think we can do this. She's hoping to get a letter of commitment tomorrow on that. And she announced that at the meeting today. They had just talked. I wanted you to also know that there's an agreement for sale or purchase of a motel. Interestingly, this motel is in McMinnville. <laughs> uh, first uh, offer was somewhere around 6.1 million. I have no idea what the final price was. Um, let's see. And it will also, uh, you know, be dealing with similar things like chronically homeless people and uh, a number of other uh, types of things. Uh, Bill for zero. Let's see. I don't, they've been engaging with uh, Stratus Village and helping with their, um, as a partner. On energy and weatherization, they've received a little over a million dollars or will by July 1st. They've already today approved about $700,000 in commitments, contracts for weatherization services. 
for people. Um, <clears throat> and they're also looking to Newberg for, as a water provider. So uh, they're <clears throat> trying to come up with client services for the provision of water. Uh, staffing, they have their new finance director is pretty much a rock star. She's accomplished incredible things in the last six months or, or however long she's been there. I think it's been about six months. Housing stabilization director, though, has resigned. Alexandra, they're also in the midst of a number of state and federal audits. So they're very, very busy. Hard to talk to Alexandra at all. <laughs> but at any rate, uh, things are very optimistic there. And it was a very interesting uh, leadership uh, meeting. Thank you, Kelly. Uh, let's move over to Remy. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I want to start by giving a report back on Edible Gardens of VM Hill County. And pardon me one moment, I had the email pulled up here and uh, I'd like to reference it specifically. Um, so Edible Landscapes of Yamhill County has been working with the city to replant the wooden boxes along Alpine Avenue, along with some other initiatives, um, including over this past weekend, they did a plant giveaway at the Mac Market. They had over 200 people attend and they gave away over 800 plants. And in addition, the seed library was also there giving away seeds. Um, specific to the Alpine project, Edible Gardens has received $2,500 in corporate sponsors. Um, and they have uh, an additional six box sponsors so far at $100 each. Um, and then they've had donated compost for all of the boxes and volunteers who have started planting them. And they're planting these boxes in themes. So if you work your way up and down, uh, Alpine Avenue, their themes are tea garden, culinary herbs, children's garden, compost experiment, salsa garden, Native American plants, backyard garden, berries, culinary lavender, and aromatic herbs. Um, and they hope to have their first in-person walking tour this July. Uh, the McMinnville Affordable Housing, ta uh, excuse me, I'm sorry, I'm still getting my correct language on this. The McMinnville Affordable Housing Commission will be meeting tomorrow. Um, we'll actually be working in a couple of breakout groups to discuss some items that have come before um, the, the previous uh, task force, um, but haven't progressed their way to council. And so we'll be doing some um, evaluation of things that we have touched on before and some some new ideas as well. So we'll be working in work groups tomorrow, um, exploring concepts regarding community land trusts and land banking and uh, construction excise tax. That meeting is open to the public. And so please, please um, feel free to attend. And at the end of that meeting, we do have an opportunity for citizen comments. Um, and then the DEI uh, advisory committee is um, continuing to work its way through a, a, a thoughtful process in terms of um, setting themselves up for success for the future and continuing to work towards having a final agenda to present uh, to the council um, uh, by the August deadline that I do understand we that that is our deadline. So we're still working in that process. Additionally, um, we're engaged in conversations with um, the Fair Housing Council. Um, both, both of those committees are engaged in conversations with the Fair Housing Council regarding some training. And, and that conversation has expanded um, uh, to other portions of the city uh, so that we're looking to uh, bring in some fair housing training, uh, not just for those committees, but for other areas in which it um, could be used throughout the city and trying to do that very efficiently um, and, and uh, with the best use of everybody's, um, uh, uh, tr trying to make one, uh, one cohesive meeting that um, people could attend for this ongoing training. And I think that that's um, the short of my report. Thank you. 
Thank you, Remy, for that report. Um, there's just two items that I'd like to report on. Uh, we have the Mc, uh, McMinnville Water and Light Commission meeting on the 18th, uh, last Tuesday. And we just, uh, uh, we had our consultant report that's dealing with the watershed and the uh, timber activities up there. We had um, an appearance report by Howard Astor and the uh, group that owns the land up in the West Hills and talking about um, what we're calling uh, tier two or level two um, uh, water that would be anything that's above the 275 foot level and uh howard came and shared with with us that that group only hires local builders local uh um providers of sub subcontractors and they're they're needing to allow mac water and light to uh use pump uh, uh, booster pumps to get water to this next subdivision that they'd be working on and um, to do what we need to do from a water and light perspective of getting a, um, um, a reservoir up in that area would be somewhere between eight and $10 million. And we need to start recouping that through SDCs or fees. And so we opened the door and staff is working on how we may be able to facilitate that for this next year and also in the long term. So more to come from that perspective. Uh, we had um, a, a big discussion on old business of a uh, review of extension policies and agreements that water and light have out and how to uh, bring that up to date with the current statutes. Um, we had the 17th extension of emergency declaration. Um, and so, but we're thinking that we're going to get really close to not having to have that extension of mer emergency declaration all dependent upon the state. We have the presentation of the draft budget for 2021-22. We had an update on the fuel station project that we're looking at putting out on the property uh, to uh, provide uh, bulk fueling for our fleet and possibly the city and others that would like to do that. We zeroed in that on June 15th, we're going to have a public hearing and a presentation on electric rates from our uh, uh, from Mark Beauchamp, who does that work for us and keeps us involved from that perspective. Also, last Thursday on the uh, 20th of May, we had a McMinn or a Newburgh Dundee bypass uh, meeting, and we're, we're talking about bringing things together. Again, I'll just let you know at the present time, uh, the governor's budget includes a $32 million. Uh, earmark for the bypass out of lottery funds. I shared with you last time, Suzanne Bonamici, Congresswoman, has done an authorization of 8 million out of her 20 million, and that's going off to uh, the Transportation Infrastructure uh, Committee under the direction of Peter DeFazio. Uh, we also learned that uh, Wyden, uh, Congressman Wyden and Merkley have given an appropriation of 5 million to the bypass. So things are moving forward on the bypass. And we talked a little bit about the infrastructure of, of local matching and what that might look like. And, um, you know, I, I think I shared just a little bit at the budget committee that our, our thoughts might be around the ability to pay down some of that outstanding debt and then add the additional debt and put it over 30 years so that our cash flow would remain fairly constant. It just goes over a longer period of time, but a lot more work to be had in those discussions. Okay, with that, let's go to department heads. Um, Amanda, I have you first. Thank you, Mayor. I have nothing to report tonight. Thank you. Kylie? Thank you, Mayor. I also have nothing to report tonight. Great. Uh, Claudia, do we have either of the chiefs uh, at the at the Civic Hall? Mr. Mayor, this is uh, Chief Rich. I have nothing to report tonight. Thank you, Chief. Uh, 
Mayor, um, Captain Jasko is on Zoom if there's a report from the police department. Okay. Rhonda, would you, do you have anything to report this evening? Uh, good evening and no, we don't. Business as usual. Thank you so very much. Heather? Thank you, Mayor. Nothing to report tonight. Thank you. Uh, Mike Bissett? Nothing this evening, Mayor. Thanks. Thank you. Jennifer? Sorry, um, it's been so quiet in my world. I have nothing to report. <laughs> yeah, we've seen way too much of you over the last week, right? <laughs> Thank you, Jennifer. Uh, Jenny? I'm going to break the streak and just have a quick report that the library starting um, next week will be open from 11 to 6 Tuesday through Saturday. So changing our hours a bit to just uh, some more consistency. Thank you, Jenny. And uh, hopefully I haven't missed anyone. Jeff, I'll end with you. Well, start a new streak. You've heard plenty from me uh, during the two budget meetings and six nights. So no further report tonight. Thank you. And a part of your packet is the February and March uh, 2021 cash and investment report that's in your packet. We have one item in the consent agenda this evening. Is there any counselor that would like to take that one item and out of the consent agenda and put it into the regular agenda? Hearing none, I will take a motion. So moved. And a second. Second. It's been moved by Zach and seconded by Sal. All in favor of approving the consent agenda, uh, please indicate by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? The consent agenda uh, passes six to zero unanimously uh, tonight. Uh, that takes us to our resolutions this evening. Our first resolution is a resolution 2021-23, a resolution appointing members to the Affordable Housing Committee. And uh, this is exciting that we're having the number of members come on. So I'll turn this over to Heather to present. Yes, yeah, so good evening, Mayor and Councilors. Uh, resolution 2021-23 appoints four new members to the Affordable Housing Committee. If you recall, we tra we transformed the task force into a committee a couple months ago and increased the membership numbers for it. And so this is filling those roles. There are four people who are being represented, uh, recommended to you tonight. The chair and vice chair and Tom Shower interviewed them. Um, the chair and vice chair being uh, Councillor Drapkin and Councillor Minky. Uh, the four members being recommended are Katie Curry, Steve Iverson, Vicki uh, Weibargan, and Howie Harkema. Um, and they have staggered tent terms as represented on the resolution. Thank you, Heather, for uh, bringing that to our attention. Any discussions or questions about uh, appointing members to the Affordable Housing Committee? I'm just glad that we have a, a experimental nuclear physicist finally on one of our committees. This is going to allow lend so much credence to our thought process. <laughs> Thank you, uh, uh, Remy. Do you did you have your hand up? Uh, other than the influx of um, Mr. Iverson's thinking abilities. Um, I would just like to add that there are particularly two people um, that we're recommending for appointment here that are longtime attendees of the McMinnville Affordable Housing Commission and who have really worked tremendously in housing throughout the city of McMinnville. Um, and uh, and so we're, we're especially excited to bring that expertise onto the committee. Thank you, Council President. Appreciate that. Well, um, with no further discussion, I don't see any other hands. I'm going to ask for a motion to approve resolution 2021-23. Uh, Do I have a motion? So moved. Second. It's been moved by Sal, seconded by Kelly. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed signify? Resolution number 
dash 23 passes unanimously six to zero. That takes us to our next resolution, which is resolution 2021-28, a resolution appointing members to the diversity, equity, and inclusion advisory committee. And so I'll call on human resources uh, manager, Kylie Byer to uh, run us through that. Let me just get to my section on the, your very long packet. <laughs> <laughs> just a second here. You caught me while I was uh, entering in the work share information. <laughs> One second. Well, it's right before that big area that Mike's going to go over on the hangar. <laughs> yes, I think I've got it here. I believe it's page 36 of your packet. Um, so as you recall, in October, the council approved an ordinance to establish the diversity equity and inclusion advisory committee um, and that committee has been off and running and uh, on the February 9th city council meeting um, the council approved a resolution appointing members to the committee um, during that resolution um, we did not establish the term length for each committee member uh, this is a brand new committee and to ensure continuity on the committee we knew we needed staggered terms and wanted each committee member to have an opportunity to um, choose a term that made sense to them um, and that they could commit to so we wanted to let them uh, go ahead and decide that we did go through that process um, at a recent diversity equity and inclusion committee meeting um, where our committee members selected their term lengths you'll see that in your packet um, that's on page 37. I also want to draw your attention to a new name on the advisory committee. Um, Alicia Overstreet, one of the um, original committee members, had to resign. Um, and Emilio Delgado was our first alternate. He was not able to commit to the schedule, so he declined to join. Um, and Sarah Schwartz is our second alternate, and she accepted enthusiastically and has already been a very engaged member of the committee. Um, so with no further explanation to this, um, before you is a recommendation to approve resolution number 2021-28. There's no financial impact associated or anticipated with this resolution um, to appoint Sarah Schwartz to the committee and to assign the recommended term lengths for each committee member. And I'm happy to answer any questions that the council may have at this time. Let's open it up for questions of Kylie. Very dynamic group. <laughs> aren't aren't you people. also adding a, a, a minor who is going to have voting privileges too? Yes. Well? Um, I'm going to come back at you all at the end of this council meeting um, with an ordinance because it does need to change the municipal code to alter that. So we'll, you'll get me one more time tonight. Okay. Any other questions? Hearing none. Um, I will ask for a motion to approve resolution 2021-28. So moved. Second. It's been uh, uh, a motion by uh, Zach and a second by Sal. All those in favor, please indicate by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed by saying nay. Resolution 2021-28 passes unanimously this evening six to zero. Thank you, Kylie, and we'll have you back uh, during the uh, ordinances. <clears throat> we have um, we have a number of ordinances that deal with uh, um, information at the airport, and so we'll go through each of the ordinances. The first one is resolution number 2021-29, a resolution uh, approving a lease, a lease agreement with the McMinnville Airport uh, Condominium Hangar uh, Owners Association for Hangar F at the airport. And so Mike Bissett, uh, uh, would you uh, present to us this evening? One of three. <laughs> Thank you, Mayor and members of the council. Um, and again, I'll refer you to your staff reports in your packet as well as copies of the proposed resolution, the lease amendment and the existing lease for um, hangar F at the airport. As the mayor noted, this is the first of three resolutions before you this evening. 
updating hangar leases, existing hangar leases at the airport to include our new uh, lease renewal terms. Um, the council will recall we've had a number of these this spring that we've updated uh, to match our current lease format that allows for lease renewals until the end of the existing or to the end of the useful building life um, in the hangar. So Dr. Lautenbach uh, re representing the uh, McMinnville Airport Condominium Hangars Association requested this uh, lease amendment and the uh, airport commission uh, unanimously recommended that the city council approve the amendment at their May 4th meeting. And so unless there are any questions, the staff would recommend you follow the airport commission's recommendation to approve this lease amendment. Thank you, Mike. Uh, any questions uh, on that first uh, resolution for Mike? Not only do we have the new resolution, but the old one that was a part of the packet. So you could get kind of the history of that. Okay, not hearing any comments, then I will ask for a motion to approve resolution 2021-29. So moved. Second. Uh, it's been moved by Zach and seconded by uh, Sal. All those in favor, please indicate by saying <coughs> aye. 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 Any opposed, please indicate by saying nay. Resolution 2021-29 passes unanimously six to zero. This takes us to resolution 2021-30, a resolution approving a lease agreement with the McMinnville Aircraft Storage uh, Committee for hangar number H at the airport. Mike, if you just go ahead. Thank you, Mayor. Um, and as noted in your council packet materials, this is a lease modification for hangar H. Uh, McMinnville Aircraft Storage Condominium owns that hangar. Alan Zanazowski requested this lease amendment and the airport commission uh, unanimously recommended the council approve this amendment at their last meeting. So unless there are any questions, uh, staff would recommend that you follow the airport commission's recommendation. Thank you, Mike. Any questions? Seeing none. Um, I will ask for a motion to, pro, uh, to approve resolution 2021-30. So moved. Ah. I'll second that one. Okay, uh, moved by Sal, seconded by Zach. All in favor, please indicate by saying aye. 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 Any, any opposed by saying nay? Resolution 2021-30 passes unanimously six to zero. This takes us to resolution 2021-31, a resolution approving a lease amendment with B and G hangar LLC for the uh, 4040 series hangar at the airport. Mike. Thank you, Mayor. And once again, uh, refer you to the materials in your packet. Um, uh, Graham Goad, representing B&G Hangar LLC, requested this amendment. And the uh, Airport Commission, uh, once again, unanimously recommend the City Council approve the amendment at their May 4th meeting. And uh, given that this is the last of our anticipated lease amendments, um, at least in my tenure, um, I did want to note that the the all of the hangar tenants that I've worked with on these amendments have been quite appreciative of the city council's willingness to um, incorporate these new lease renewal terms into their leases. So um, I know you've seen a lot of these um, this spring, but it, they are appreciated. And I, I do think that um, it is um, it's paving the way probably for some increased development at the airport in the future as well. So unless there are any questions, staff would recommend you follow the airport commission's recommendation to approve this lease amendment. Thank you, Mike. Kelly. Mike, does this pretty much cover all the hangers so that they all kind of renew in one year or within a certain time period? So it's a lot easier to follow them. So interestingly enough, these amendments um, uh, changed the way that the, the leases will end by allowing for five-year extensions, but they didn't actually change the lease term as far as when, when that an, uh, initial renewal period will start. So uh, all of these uh, leases that you've seen over the last um, 
a uh, few months have different end dates, if you will. And so the, the, the finance department and the, um, and the city moving forward will need to continue to track the leases and when they um, are coming to their um, end of term, the tenants are responsible for notifying the city if they wanna engage in the five-year renewal process. So um, it will be a, a staggered process over time. Okay, thank you. I just, just sometimes that's been kind of an issue, so that's why I asked. Any other questions? Hearing none, then I will ask for a motion to approve resolution 2021-31. So moved. Okay. Second. It's been moved by Adam and seconded by Sal. All in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed signify by saying nay. Resolution 2021-31 passes unanimously six to zero. This takes us to resolution 2021-32, a resolution approving entering into a contract with Marina and Company LL, uh, uh, LLB or P. So we'll call on Jennifer to update us on our, account, our, our contract for um, our audit services. Uh, uh, good evening, everyone. Um, there are materials in your packet that describe the process um, as well as a resolution in the contract. So um, in short, we conducted an RFP. Um, the um, we had four really great uh, candidates to um, put forward proposals and the top two um, scores were passed to the audit committee and the audit committee um, interviewed both um, candidate firms and um, suggested that we should go with Marina and Company who also are our current auditors. And so um, this, this contract will um, allow us to continue working um, with this audit firm. And it's a five year not to, um, not to exceed um, contract, which means they will be charging us their actuals. So it won't necessarily um, be the full amount that's in the contract each year. And there are five optional years and that's a GFOA best practice. So. If folks have any questions about process or the contract or anything um, related, I'm happy to field those. Thank you, Jennifer. Any questions for Jennifer? I have, a, I have one. Go ahead. Go ahead, Adam. Uh, Jennifer, I was just wondering what was the uh, like major distinguishing factor? Did uh, Marina and company just get the the nod simply from the historical perspective? Um, I, I wouldn't characterize it that way. Um, we had in the, in, there were two rounds of judging. So in the initial round, there were three staff members and we invited two uh, finance managers, municipal finance managers from other jurisdictions here locally to also weigh in. So it was a decent balance, I think on that um, front. And Marina was the, the highest um, ranked uh, firm coming out of that round. And then we just, we reset the scores to zero for the audit committee. Um, and so I don't know if um, Mayor Hill or uh, Councilor Menke, if, if you wanna um, give any insights to, um, to that, do you, do you think it weighed heavily there having been our prior auditor? I, uh, we, well, That's good. Uh, both of these we've had as auditors before, uh, Adam. So we know both firms very well. And we went through rigorous questioning um, of, of the audit staff with the managing partner and uh, the director of operations. And so uh, again, we could have gone either way. And we all said this, that we couldn't have gone wrong. These are two firms that are very focused in the municipal um, area of, uh, of auditing. Uh, and 
you know, we just felt that we had a great rapport. We have a, a, a very knowledgeable staff with Marine and company. Tanya is phenomenally well respected throughout the state and is very respected within the accounting industry and on many committees within the state of Oregon. So Kelly, any, any other thoughts from your perspective? I just want to assure all of you, it was a very lively discussion about both firms uh, and uh, we did quite a bit of back and forth uh, with them and between ourselves on the decision. So uh, it, it was not an easy discussion. Okay. Yeah, you, with the with the lines open during our discussion, so they both got to hear our discussion. So it makes it a little more difficult. <laughs> okay. Any any other questions? Did that hand, did that take care of your question, Adam? Uh, yeah, I really appreciate the additional context. If for some reason this resolution didn't pass tonight, would it automatically default to that other provider that was in the top two? Um. No, well, we we discussed um, we discussed what the next steps would be, and if the decision out of the audit committee, if I recall correctly, was if we were unsuccessful in our ability to um, come to a um, negotiated agreement on the contract, that we would go to the second choice and start the the contract negotiation process over again. Councillor Garvin, if I can just jump in as well, um, I just wanted to note that in the RFP, there are very specific guidelines of the scoring that has to occur um, by the selection committee. So um, those, and there's number, there's assignments of numbers for each of those. So it can't just be like, oh, you had a great interview. There's specific parameters that the selection committee uses to evaluate each each um, person or each consultant. So. Um, just to add some more context about how the evaluation is done. Thank you for that, Amanda. Any other questions? Hearing none, then I will ask for a motion to approve resolution number 2021-32. So moved. Oh, go ahead, I'd second. Um, it was moved by Sal and seconded by Kelly. All those in favor, please indicate by saying aye. 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 Any opposed, please signify by saying nay. 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 Okay. Um, I didn't hear everyone, so let's go through. Uh, I think I'll just kind of poll everyone. Uh, those that uh, those in favor of uh, of uh, saying uh, those in favor, please indicate uh, with a raise of your hand, Mr. Mayor. Yes. Would it be out of question, uh, out of order for me to ask a question of some of the fellow counselors on the voice vote? Yeah, we can have a discussion within the group. So go ahead, Sal. Adam, and can you share some of your thoughts on the on this vote? Yeah, just um, for me, an, an auditor is is like a CPA in the private sector, and. I just feel that we've gotten too comfortable with Marine and Company, and if we didn't have an awesome uh, finance director and Jennifer, I feel that we would still be missing the boat on a eight hundred thousand um, dollar thing with Water and Light. And if we have another provider that scored almost exactly the same, and there was a lengthy discussion, I would like to give that other provider a chance to. Um, present with the city and as long as I've been around Marina has been our auditor from from my recollection so if there's another provider out there that can do the job and scored well and at least led to a lengthy discussion I would like to give them the opportunity thank you for that context and uh, uh, Jennifer just uh, just to ask another question Marina and had been with the city for longer than that, but that um, that's not a data point that I have. Um, yeah, at least just 10 at years. my fingertips. Yeah, at least ten years, and and when we picked Marina and Company, we saw such a difference between this second firm and uh, Marina and Company. Um, so, but uh, Adam, point well taken. Um, other than remembering that the air that water and light had was it, it, it's accounts receivable that we get information from them 
per se, and it wasn't something that we're tracking because we had no insight into what was happening at Water and Light. So more of that onus uh, ought to be on Water and Light because they were the one that did the miscalculation. And like I said- In an audit ahead. situation, <clears throat> there's a contract and it very clearly disclaims what they are going, what they will audit, and what they're not going to audit, and they were not going to audit water and light because they're already been audited theoretically. Can I ask uh, another follow-up question. Did, could I say one Sorry. more? Sorry, Sal. Excuse me. <clears throat> uh, ten years is not. I, I think it's still appropriate under the GFOA to go ten years. Uh, that was brought forward to me from uh, Jennifer, and I did bring that particular issue up. So um, overall, I, I, I support the decision. Uh, Jeff, you had your hand up. I just wanted to clarify that um, Marina and company, nor their predecessor auditor, as far as I know, have ever been tasked with auditing water and light or reviewing the audit provided by a separate auditor for water and light. Um, that's not been in their scope of services. Um, so uh, with that point of clarification, I'll um, let the rest of the conversation move on. May I ask a follow-up question of either Jeff or Jennifer? Go ahead. Um, or really anybody who can chime in here. Um, do, do you have, uh, with many of these kinds of services, they're such specialized services that there really are only a handful of companies that provide them. Is that the case with with this type of city auditing? Are there really only a couple of players in the state that do almost all of the work? Um, I wouldn't characterize it as a couple, um, but there aren't many. Um, that's that is true, um, and certainly there aren't. Um, I don't know. Maybe there are half dozen to a dozen that are. Um, somewhat engaged with the Oregon GFOA and the Nash, um, well, I can speak for Oregon GFOA. And certainly the firms that we did re receive proposals from, um, all of them are engaged with um, Oregon GFOA and are well known to me, even though I've never worked with any of the firms um, before coming to McMinnville specifically. But um, so I, I have no, um, concerns about getting um, a quality line of service from, frankly, any of the um, audit firms that that proposed. Um, I, I am comfortable going forward with um, Marina and company. Um, Thank you. Um, Tanya is particularly um, experienced in federal um, auditing, and she um, teaches at a national level um, about how to do federal auditing. Um, so that's, I think that's a strength that we will need going forward with the single audit and the amounts of federal money that we'll be getting. But um, but yeah, I'm, you know, other than that little tidbit of, I know her to be particularly strong and an expertise that we need, um, I'm agnostic in terms of who we ultimately um, go with other than I guess from a process perspective, whether we're, um, you know, whether we're in any um, problem areas with the procurement, um, but that I'm I'm not clear on. So, so Councilor Peralta, what I would add is that uh, in addition to there being you know a handful, but a you know relatively small group of firms that do this kind of work in Oregon, um, there are also firms who either specialize in, you know, very small or very large organizations. Um, some audit firms focus more on special districts than on cities. And at least some of the firms take sort of a geographic perspective on the clients with whom they work. So um, it would be unusual for us to get, you know, 10 or 15 proposals, um, no matter where we were located. Um, I, I will also say that, you know, simply from a having been through a boatload of audits over the course of my career, um, Tanya as the managing partner is uh, has the ability to make the information really accessible in a way that many auditors do not. So I have always appreciated that about her. 
So I, I just want to clarify my understanding. J Jennifer, you're, you, you, your leaning for this firm was their particular expertise in federal, working with these federal programs that we're going to be dealing with more this year. And, and Jeff, your, your perspective is that they just provide a better data set or more information. Well, to, to be fair, I, I didn't evaluate the proposals. And so I wouldn't feel comfortable, um, you know, ranking any of the uh, applying partner firms. I do trust the process and the audit committee they went mm -hmm. through that went through the process. I just wanted to make the point about, you know, Tanya's particular ability to communicate the information around audits impresses me. I, it's, it's not a criteria for making your decision. It's just some, it. some uh, feedback. I appreciate the context. Thank you. Thank you, counselors, for questions. Any further questions? Because it sounds like we may have a split vote, I'm just going to call on each counselor and you give me an an, an I or a nay. Zach? Nay. Uh, Remy? Aye. Chris? Nay. Uh, Kelly? Aye. Sal? Aye. And Adam? Nay. That gives us a, a, a three eyes, three nays. And so it, I think, will fall with me to split the vote on resolution 2021-32. And I give an I. So the, um, the resolution 20. 2021-32, and I'm going to stop for a moment. Amanda, is what I did, is that appropriate? Correct. Okay, so resolution 2021-32 passes on a vote of four in favor, three in opposition. Thank you for that lively discussion and, and being able to get down into some of the real details. Okay. Next, we have resolution number 2021-34, resolution amending the planning fee schedule for land use compatibility statements for marijuana dispensaries, producers, and wholesalers, and change in business name. Heather, could you run us through this resolution? Yes, yeah, so Mayor and Councilors, this is um, a follow-up from a meeting that we had when we passed the planning fee schedule that's due to be updated and take effect July 1st, 2021. And in that fee schedule, we had one fee for uh, what we call land use compatibility statements for marijuana uh, businesses. And Councilor Garvin had um, asked two questions, or for three. Um, one, he asked why the fee was as, as so much higher than our other land use compatibility statement reviews, and then asked um, if there was a difference in terms of the amount of time it takes to review the different types of marijuana businesses in the community. So under state licensing, um, there are land use compatibility statements that are required for new dispensaries that are opening up in the community, um, for new producers, um, that are uh, producing in a community for new um, extractors that are extracting in a community. And then if a business goes through a change in business name, they need to go through a whole new land use compatibility statement process. And so uh, after that meeting, Commissioner Garvin gave us, um, asked us to do some work and, and look at those different scenarios and reevaluate them in our model to see if the fees are reflecting what the work is. When we put the original fee schedule together, it was in 2018 and it was based on 2017 experience. So staff sat with the consultant team and worked through um, the amount of time it took to work through each land use process in the land use process, we have intake um, for the land use application. We have review of the land use application in terms of the research. We have the decision, and then we have the follow-up on the decision. So we went through each of those processes for all land use applications. In 2017, we were still new into um, how to work through, um, work with our state agencies. There's two different state agencies we need to work through, work with for, uh, marijuana land use compatibility statements, the health authority and the OLCC. 
they were new into their programs as well. And it was not an easy process to navigate um, for anybody, I think, for us as the city, as well as those who are trying to get licenses. And then in the city of McMinnville, we have, uh, we don't have a complicated code when it comes to citing um, marijuana businesses, but there are, there are standards in there that we need to be reviewing, uh, particularly a spacing standard for the dispensaries. And so that does um, entail a process for us to do the review. And what was um, tripping us up with the state agencies is it takes 12 to, it takes anywhere from 12 to 18 months for a state agency to review a license application for a marijuana business. And the LUX statement happens at the beginning of that process. So we'll put, we'll fill out the LUX form and then we'll say, this is approved. However, if another business comes in and is approved at the state level prior to this business, that's within 2000 feet, this one will not no longer be um, legitimate in our code. And, um, and that the state, we had a hard time with the state working through how to do that. Their review processes were different for each licensing. So there could be a business that comes in, it takes them six months and another business would take 18 months. And so we had businesses that were lobbying against each other for those spacing standards and it became quite an issue. We got our legal counsel together with their legal counsel and we figured it out with some documents. But all that, all that sort of experimentation was part of our, our processing in 2017 and was reflected in our fees. So we did go through the whole process again. Um, I asked my team to go through the process. We put it into the model that we have for how we um, capture the full cost recovery. And I explained that model in the staff report. And then um, based on Councilor Garvin's request, we did four different scenarios. Um, we did a scenario for dispensaries, a scenario for producers, um, and a scenario for co-location of businesses, and then a scenario for a change in business name. Um, based on that, we discovered that both the producer wholesaler and the co-located producer wholesaler are essentially the same amount of time. Because even though it's co-locating with another business, we still have to go through the same review. And what we have to do is we sign the Lux form certifying that it meets state provisions um, for how these are cited in the, in the city as well as city provisions. So we still go through all the review for both of them. So our recommendation to you tonight is to amend the planning fee schedule by um, adding two additional um, fee schedule components to it and changing the fees associated with them. So the land use compatibility statement for a marijuana dispensary we're recommending is $912.75. A marijuana producer wholesaler is $667 and a marijuana change in business name is $477.25. And that's reflective of the July 1 inflationary index. We'll make these effective immediately. Um, we have let, we have an application right now. We've let them know that we were going through this process and bringing it to city council. We'll, if this is passed tonight, we'll honor that fee schedule with them and we other um, businesses that come in between now and July 1. And then it will carry forward with the July 1 schedule. Thank you, Heather. Any questions of Heather on this resolution? Mr. Mayor, I have a comment, not Go a ahead. question really. Go ahead, Adam. Heather, I just wanted to thank you and your staff for the speed at which you turned this around. When I raised those concerns, I didn't expect it to be back in front of us two months later. So I just wanted to congratulate you on that and uh, say thank you and I know that others in the industry uh, will be very happy to see these changes that oh. reflect more common fee structure throughout the industry yeah and thank you counselor you know we don't like tra charging fees to businesses either and we felt that this was something important for us to look at immediately and so we, we made the effort to make sure we were able to get in our work program to do so um, there was one question at the meeting, which I would pass on to you, Councillor, which was um, uh, the change in business name and whether that needs a land use compatibility statement. So a lot of these businesses are changing names based on investors that are coming in and out of the businesses. And we're seeing that a lot in McNimble. 
Um, and to me, that's not really a land use compatibility statement, but we have to respond to what the state tells us we need to do, but that might be something for the industry to, to talk about with the state. Noted and thank you. Any other questions for Heather? Uh, it's just not a question, but I just want to um, thank you for that last comment. When you were giving the presentation at the beginning, I was wondering why something like a name change would trigger uh, reprocessing. So thank you for bringing that up in, in this forum. Um, are there other forums in which that question is being brought up that you're aware of or? No, I, I don't, I, you know, we do land use compatibility statements for all sorts of things and it is what it's meant to be, which is a land use compatibility. And the change in business name is not something that normally comes into play as a trigger for that, so. Okay. Uh, Councilor President Drabkin, just to clarify, so OLCC rec laws, um, if any ownership changes by 51% or more is when uh, it triggers a new luck statement. And that's basically what triggers a change in ownership name. So you'll see uh, minority investors come and go and the names never change. But once there's a major shift in ownership, that's typically when you see the LLC that's operating that dispensary or production facility or extraction facility change its business name. And does the Oregon Cannabis Association have a perspective on that? Uh, with COVID, the lobbyist movement in the cannabis scene has been very minimal. So hopefully next legislation cycle, they will be a lot more active, but it's died off considerably um, given the nature of the industry, they really like to do things face to face and that's just not going on this year. Any other discussion? Thank you for those questions, Remy. Okay, um, do I have a motion to approve resolution 2021-34? So moved. Second? Second. It's been moved by Adam and seconded by Zach. All in favor, please indicate by saying aye. 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 Any opposed signify by saying nay. Resolution number 2021-34 passes unanimously six to zero. That takes us to our next uh, resolution, which is resolution 2021-35, a resolution ap approving a building fee schedule and repealing all previous resolutions, adopting building fee schedules on the effective day of this uh, uh, fee schedule. We'll turn that over to Heather also. Yeah, so um, this resolution is really a housekeeping item at this point in time. If you recall, you approved a resolution um, back in March, um, resolution 2021-13, after conducting a public hearing for the proposed fee schedule. Um, what we need to do according to uh, uh, Oregon Community Building Services and state regulations is we need to notify them 45 days in advance of this becoming effective that the city is considering um, this fee schedule. And so we come to you with the consideration, you say, yes, that's what we'd like to do. We then send it to the state. They post it on their website for all their users and clients to review um, those, those clients have 45 days to um, comment on it or appeal it. And then it, then it comes back to you for a final approval. Any so tonight's questions? the final. Okay, any questions or discussion among council? Seeing none, uh, I will ask for a motion to approve resolution 2021-35. So moved. Second. Second. It's been moved by Kelly and seconded by Adam. All in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Resolution 2021-35 passes unanimously six to zero. 
This takes us to our, um, we have a ordinance this evening and um, is there any counselor, counselor that needs to declare a potential conflict of interest or reclusing themselves regarding this ordinance? Hearing none, uh, then uh, will the city attorney please read the ordinance by title only? This is the first reading of ordinance number 5103 and ordinance amending section 2.35.030 of the McMinnville Municipal Code specific to membership, number of members, appointments, and ex officio members. Thank you, uh, Amanda. And so we'll call on Human Resources uh, Manager Kylie to, to present uh, this to the council. Thank you. I'll refer you to page number 149 in your packet. This is an ordinance um, updating the municipal code um, to the specific to the membership, number of members, appointments, and ex officio members of the Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Advisory Committee. Um, as uh, Councillor Menke mentioned a little earlier, this is to um, update the full voting rights of our committee members. Um, we had a really nice discussion as a group at our last um, DEIAC meeting. Um, and the committee members brought up the fact that our youth members actually, it's not very equitable for them to not have a full vote at the table. Um, and when we set up the initial ordinance, we just sort of copied language from a previous ordinance establishing a committee. Um, in doing that, our youth liaison was not a voting member and our council liaison is also not a voting member. Um, committee members from the DEIAC recommend that uh, those two committee members be full voting members. Um, in doing so, it raises the membership of the committee from officially seven to nine and still allows for ex officio members to be appointed um, should the council choose to do so. Um, we did feel like this really aligned with, um, I guess, the purpose of the entire committee um, in making sure that our McMinnville residents can better participate in the decision making process. And in doing so, this way, all of our committee members are able to do so. Um, so, unless there's a bunch of questions, um, we would recommend as the I would recommend as the staff liaison for the count for the committee that the council move to approve this ordinance. Um, there's no anticipated fiscal impact, um, but I can anticipate that this committee may recommend that we do this with other committees as well. Um, and with that, I will entertain any questions that you may have. Any questions from the council? Mr. Mayor, may I? Yes, go ahead. Uh, I don't have a specific question, but I just want to let the other members of this council know that I did recuse myself from the vote. vote being the liaison uh, to the DEIAC uh, committee at the time that that committee took the vote about whether or not the council liaison would have a uh, vote. Thank you for uh, bringing that to our attention, Council President Grabkin. Any other questions or discussion? Hearing none, then I will um, ask for a motion to pass ordinance number 5103 to a second reading. Do I have a motion? So moved. Second. It's been uh, moved by Zach and seconded by uh, Sal. All in favor, please indicate by saying aye. 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 Any opposed, indicate by saying nay. It, um, the, first, the, the first reading of uh, ordinance 5103 passes unanimously six to zero. And so what I'll have happen now then is I'll have the city attorney uh, do a second reading of ordinance 5103. Amanda? This is the second reading of ordinance number 5103 and ordinance amending section 2.35.030 of the McMinnville Municipal Code specific to membership number of members, appointments, and ex officio members. Thank you. I will ask for a motion to adopt. Uh, well, let me back up. Any, any questions? 
Seeing none, I will ask for a motion to adopt ordinance number 5103. So moved. Uh, was moved by Sal and uh, seconded by Zach. Um, we'll ask the city recorder to poll the council. Councilor Garvin? Aye. Councilor Geary? Aye. Councilor Minky? Aye. Councilor Chenoweth? Aye. Councilor Peralta? Aye. And Council President Drabkin? Aye. Ordinance number 5103 passes unanimously with a vote of six to zero. That takes us to the end of our agenda this evening, uh, reminding council members that we're, we have one more meeting and executive session, and that's on a different, you'll have to go back and, and pull that Zoom number to go a, to be able to go into that. So uh, it is now 8.55 and we adjourn city council meeting. Thank you.